Hi, my name is Robert McMurray, and I'm a program manager on the Internet Information Services team. And just by way of introduction about myself, I've been with Microsoft a little over 16 years. And during that time, I've worn a lot of different hats here at Microsoft. I started out in technical support, and I did that for about 10 years. And then I spent several years as a technical writer where I wrote the software development kit documentation for IIS. And for the last several years, I've been a program manager focusing on a bunch of different technologies. And so with that in mind, I thought it would be you know, kind of cool to sit down and take a look at some of the exciting new things we put in IIS 8. And specifically, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, sandboxing and security features that we've added in IIS 8. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is CPU throttling. And for anyone who's been around IIS for a while, you've realized that, that we actually added CPU throttling in the past. But the, the way that it worked in the past is whenever a worker process was starting to take too much CPU usage, we'd just kill the worker process for a short amount of time. And then we'd recycle that worker process later. And from an application point of view, that, that's not great because it, it means your application is down for a short amount of time. So what we did in IIS 8 is we worked with the kernel team to work on true CPU throttling. And the way this works is uh, you can configure a, a amount of CPU usage that your worker process is going to take, and the operating system will prevent you from exceeding that. So as it starts to, to ramp up in its amount of CPU usage, we actually throttle that and, and keep that back under the threshold that you set for it. And then we've also introduced a new setting on top of that, which is related, which is called CPU throttling under load. And the way that works is you can configure a worker process or an application pool to throttle under load. And when there's nothing else going on in the operating system, then it will just give it more CPU usage as it needs it. And then uh, when another process starts up that needs more CPU usage, it'll actually start throttling back your worker process and give that CPU usage to the other application. And like I said, this is great for a multi-tenant scenario because it means you don't have two applications that are slugging it out for the same amount of CPU. So uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at the demo. So what I've done here is I've written a very short batch file that's going to loop through, and it's going to make five requests to a page I have that's just going to do a, a do loop. And it's going to put the system into a very bad state. It's going to start trying to consume all of the CPU usage. So let me go ahead and close this get that out of the way. And now I'm going to run the batch file. And it's going to start Internet Explorer and start making all of these requests to my system. And so you notice that the requests are processing right now. And if I switch to Process Explorer, you'll see my worker process start jumping up in CPU usage. So uh, as it continues to open the different browsers and go to that page, you'll notice that my CPU usage right now is sitting right around 100%. So this, of course, is, is not a great experience. So uh, first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and close my browser because I wrote the application in such a way that I can clean up from it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my application pool here. And when I go down to my settings, I can bring up the advanced settings. And we have down here CPU throttling. Now, we had this before, as I mentioned. And I can come in here and enter the amount of CPU usage in thousandths of a percent. So for 10% of the CPU, I'm going to enter 10,000 here. And we have the drop down. Now, in the past, we had no action and kill W3WP, which kills the worker process. But these are the two new settings that we have here. The first one that we have is throttle. So I'm going to go ahead and enable that. And when I apply that, I can go back to my batch file and rerun it. Now, as I showed you a moment ago, it's going to open up Internet Explorer and start making these requests to my system. But now when we switch over and take a look at my worker process, you'll notice that my CPU usage is going to be hovering right around that 10%. So we're actually throttling back that usage. It's still a badly written application, and it's still trying to steal more CPU usage than uh, I would want it to have normally. But it's going to keep the rest of the system working quite well. And if I bring up the CPU graph here, you'll notice that you see that CPU usage is staying right below that 10%. So this this is a good experience. But something else that I'd also like to show is we don't just work with the worker process itself. I also happen to have PHP deployed on this machine. So what I can do now is I have a similar batch file that's going to do the similar thing with PHP now. So this is going to loop through and open up several browsers. And it's going to browse to a PHP page that's going to put the system into a high CPU state. So now if you go over here and you take a look, I have my worker process. But you see all of these PHP CGI child processes that are getting fired up underneath that same worker process. And you'll notice that all of them now are competing for that same 10% of the CPU usage. So what we're doing here is we're not just throttling the worker process itself. We're throttling the worker process and all of its children. This is a much better experience. And like I mentioned before, this is great in a multi-tenant scenario because it means now that I can have multiple sites that are all configured for CPU throttling. And they're all going to share my CPU quite nicely. But let's take a look at one more setting here. Let me go ahead and first things first, close my browser. 
And what I want to do is go back to my advanced settings. And what I want to do now is I want to change the setting to throttle under load. I mentioned this a moment ago, and what this means is that it's going to allow my worker process to take more CPU usage when the system's not doing anything else. So if I go back to Process Explorer here, you'll notice that I've not really got anything else going on. So I have my worker process, it's sitting idle, I have my PHP CGI processes, and they're all sitting idle right now. If I go back to my ASP.NET page and make some requests to that, you'll notice that my worker process is going to start taking up more CPU usage, and that's because I've put it in throttle under load. But now if I go and I start up a different application that wants to consume a bunch of CPU, and this is a small multi-threaded app, and I'm going to say I want it to start three threads, and each one of those is going to take a bunch of CPU usage, you'll notice that my worker process now has dropped down, whereas this application is now taking 66% of my CPU usage. And if I stop this and I tell it I want it to take even more CPU usage, then now you'll notice that my worker process drops down to its 10%, what we set it at, and then you'll notice that this process now has almost all of my CPU. So switching to the graph, you'll see the CPU is uh, right around the top right now, but you'll notice that it's not my website that's taking the processing power. Now that we've taken a look at some of the sandboxing features by way of CPU throttling, let's take a look at some of the security features that we've done in IS8. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is dynamic IP restrictions. And for anyone who's been around IS for any time at all, you've realized that in the past we had static IP restrictions. And the way those worked is you had a, a list that you could create. The, think of it as like a white list and a black list of IP addresses that you wanted to always allow on your system or IP addresses that you wanted to block on your system. And this works, but it's, it's more of a manual process because you have to actually go through forensically and look through your IIS logs and try to see who's maybe doing bad things to your system. And with dynamic IP restrictions, we kind of take some of that off by identifying a couple of different things that, that malicious users would try to do your system in order to cause something like a denial of service attack. So what we do is we, we look for two specific things. We look for uh, a, a number of simultaneous uh, connections, and we also look for a, a number of connections within a certain amount of time. And then what we do whenever we detect one of those conditions happening is we just drop the connection. And so it prevents somebody from being able to do something like uh, denial of service. And with that in mind, let me show you what that looks like. So what I've got here is a batch file that's going to open up a bunch of connections to my website. And in this particular case, I'm going to uh, loop through and I'm going to open up 10 instances. And what I'm doing is I'm browsing to a page that's uh, just a slow page. All it's doing is it's an ASP.NET page that's going to go into a sleep state for 30 seconds. What this means, though, is that each subsequent request to my box, it's not going to recycle the connection. It's going to be a new connection. And um, what this means is that, so if I just run this batch file right now, what it's going to do is it's going to browse to my system and it's going to open up all of these pages and all of them are simultaneously connecting, all of them are taking up CPU processing time. If this was a long running operation, like something going to a SQL server, then, um, then uh, you would notice the, the slowdown for your system. So I have all of these running right now and this is the default state. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to go ahead and just close out of my browser and I'm going to switch over to my default website. And what I want to do now is bring up my IP and re domain restrictions. Now this is the same user interface that we've had in the past, except you've noticed we've added this new action over here. So if I click Edit Dynamic IP Restrictions, I have my two different choices here that I mentioned just a moment ago. The first one is to say I want to deny the IP address based on the number of concurrent requests. Well, in this system, I'm just browsing my local system, so it's going to be throttling on localhost. But this could be on the internet, and it would be throttling the number of uh, connections that are coming into your system across the internet in the same way. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK to this. And now when I go ahead and run that same batch file, it's going to start making these requests to my system. And I'll get through the first number of connections. And then after that, it's going to start failing the connections. So this is the, the demo of the concurrent requests. The first five went through because that's what was configured in the settings, but then the following five failed. What's kind of interesting here is we have the substatus code, which is the 501. And this is actually a really useful piece of information. If I go back to the feature, I can show you down here that it says there's a logging only mode. And we return the same substatus code even on a success. So if I were to check this, the requests would have actually gone through, but they would have had a substatus code that it could have gone back in my logs later and taken a look at and kind of done some forensic processing to see whether or not this feature would have actually been using itself. So 
I've already shown you the concurrent requests. The other one we have here is based on the number of uh, simultaneous requests over a period of time. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna change this down to something very small, just to like five, and I'm going to say five in a very large amount of time just so I can make the demo work here. So that's five requests um, within uh, 10 seconds. So I'm gonna go ahead and say okay. And I have another batch file that I'm going to run that will make a bunch of connections here. And so once again, this is gonna do 25 connections and each one of those is gonna sleep for 60 seconds. And if I run this, you're going to see a bunch of instances of Internet Explorer all start up. And you'll notice now that, that several of these actually resulted in the failure because it was trying to make too many connections within a certain amount of time. And you'll notice now that the substatus code changed from 501 to 502. And so once again, this is a way that you could track this information so you could go back and take a look at your logs after the fact and see that actually the, the, you would have been blocking requests even if you're saying that you were in logging only mode. So let me clean up some of these instances of Internet Explorer and show you the last thing that I want to show you in here. And that is basically we've allowed you to change the behavior for what you return with your denials. So in the past, all we returned was an HTTP 403, which was a forbidden. And what we've done in IIS 8 is we've allowed you to actually change what we actually do when we deny the request. So for example, if I can change it to unauthorized, that would return an HTTP 401. If I change it to not found, that'll return an HTTP 404. And for each one of these, it's still gonna use that substatus code of 501 or 502, depending on whether it was based on concurrent requests or whether it was based on the number of connections when a certain amount of time. And the last thing I'm gonna do down here is I'm gonna say I just wanna configure abort and then I'll show you what that looks like by going back and saying I only wanna allow five concurrent requests and rerun my original batch file. So when I run this, it's going to start opening up instances of Internet Explorer and browsing to my machine and what you'll notice is now it's actually saying that there's nothing at this website at all. So this is a great way when you've got somebody who's attempting to make too many connections to your server or flood your server that you can actually make your web server sort of disappear off the Internet. And it's a good way to, to take hackers and just kind of push them away from your server. Since we've taken a look at dynamic IP restrictions, which is an HTTP feature, let's turn around, let's take a look at FTP logon restrictions, which is obviously for the file transfer protocol service that we have for ISA. So here's the way this works. In the past, FTP has been a primary vehicle for a lot of hackers to try to break into a system, and they do this by either doing a dictionary attack or a brute force attack on a known password, let's say like the administrator account. And what they do is they just start hitting your FTP server with a whole bunch of logon attempts just trying to see if they ever get back a success status. And of course, this is obviously bad from a security point of view. Now, there's ways that people mitigated this in the past. If, if you're running an Active Directory domain, then you can set things like password restrictions so that after a person and fails to log in five times or something, then they're blocked out for a lockout period. Well, the downside to that is, of course, it means that your valid user is going to be locked out during that time period. So some hacker is trying to break into your box, and now they've locked out the, the actual user, and this is a bad thing. So we introduced this new FTP logon restrictions, and this isn't really a lockout. It's, it's more like a preventative measure in that you configure a number of times that a person can fail to log in, and then we just block them from being able to connect to the server. We actually just do a hard disconnect on their FTP session, and we just kind of push them off the system until that time interval cycles back around. And so rather than talk about it anymore, I'd, I'd rather show it. So let's take a look at the demo. So what I have here is my default website, and I've added FTP publishing to it. So if I drop out to a command prompt now, what I can do is I can say FTP localhost, and if I enter administrator, since I know I'm local, I can enter my password, and I can do a directory listing just to show that I can see all my files. So pretty straightforward. But what I've brought along with me today for the demo is I've brought a dictionary attack that I wrote in VB script. It's not a very elegant one. It's just one I wrote one weekend because I was bored. And um, I've, what it uses is a dictionary attack uh, word list, which I just went out to uh, Bing and just searched for word lists and came up with this list. But what I'm gonna do just for the purposes of the demo is I'm gonna go ahead and just add my password to the bottom of it just to fix simulate, being able to guess my password. Now there are password lists that you can get that are stronger than this one. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna run this batch file which invokes uh, the scripting engine. And you'll see here kind of the background, it's zipping through a bunch of different temp files. What it's actually doing now is it's making 
um, hundreds of requests at my server in order to try to guess uh, passwords. Now, if we go back to the dictionary attack while it's running in the background, if I say I want to see the number of uh, uh, passwords that's in here, it's really about 850. It's not that many. So it's not a very big password list. But on my system, it's able to actually go through and make all of these requests in a short amount of time. So if I bring up this window now, it shows that it managed to zip, zip through all 850 of those passwords in just a little under 30 seconds to arrive at my my, uh, my actual true password. So I could have easily written the script as a brute force, and a brute force wouldn't have needed me to add the, the password to the bottom of that password uh, dictionary. So what I'd like to do now is switch over to my FTP server. And what I want to do now is actually enable the FTP logon restrictions. So uh, it's disabled by default, but once you turn that on, the default settings are four failed logon attempts within 30 seconds. So if I go ahead and apply this, now that that's actually enabled on my system, if I try to FTP uh, into my box again, first of all, if I log in as my user, I can get in successfully just by entering my password. But let's say that I was a hacker, and let's say that this was something that was uh, automated. So if I say uh, localhost, and now I can just start entering uh, bad passwords and users. And let me try that again, and try that again. And you'll notice now it actually says connection closed by localhost. I can exit out of here, and if I attempt to connect again, it will continue telling me that the connection has been closed by rem remote host. And so what it's doing in this case is it's detected that somebody has failed those four times from my IP address within the 30 seconds. And so now it's just immediately dropping the connection and thereby preventing someone from a trying to get back into my system and do something like a, a password attack. Now, once that 30 second time interval actually closes, then actually I'll be able to get back into my system. So now you notice 30 seconds have gone by. I can turn around and I can get back in using my credentials. So this is a great deterrent from someone else being able to block into my system using either a dictionary attack or a brute force attack. And yet the interval is short enough that actually I can still get back in as the valid user within a short amount of time. So over the past few demos, we've taken a look at some of the cool new sandboxing and security features that we've put in IIS 8. First of all, we took a look at CPU throttling. Then next, we took a look at dynamic IP restrictions. And then last, we looked at FTP logon restrictions. And rather than just take my word for it, you can browse out and download the eval today. And if you like what you see, please go to is.net and tell us what you think. Thanks.